I stood before a preacher, and the preacher said, Do you? And I said, I do. And I made one of the greater decisions of my life. I married my wife for life. July the 1st, 1977, so 46 years ago today. Yeah, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. I am spending my 46th anniversary with the Paintsville Church. We got married on a Friday night in Huntsville, Alabama. We went on a honeymoon. Guess where we went on our honeymoon? Gatlinburg. That's, you know, a lot of people do, but we did not. Uh, we went to Atlanta, Georgia on our honeymoon. You know, young people are getting married today, and they're going to Cancun, Mexico, and Montego Bay, Jamaica, and Paris, France, Gatlinburg. I was just glad to make it to Six Flags over Georgia. <laughs> we actually went to Six Flags on our honeymoon. Well, Sunday came, we went to church. I mean, that's what you do on a honeymoon, right? You go to church. We went to church, and uh, when the local preacher found out that I was a preacher, I was a kid preacher, 20 years old, he walked up to me and he said, Well, son, if you had brought your sermon, I would let you preach. And I said, Well, I brought my sermon. So he let me preach. Did you guys preach on your honeymoon? Uh, some of you were preached to on your honeymoon, right? Well, I, I preached on my honeymoon. Guess what I preached about on my honeymoon? No, not that bold, not that bold. I, I preached about heaven. How beautiful heaven must be. That's kind of sweet, isn't it? Kind of romantic. I mean, you get married on Friday night and two days later you get up and talk about how beautiful heaven is going to be. I mean, that's better than the alternative, right? That's better than get it up and saying, hey folks, I got married on Friday night. Now I want to talk to you about what hell is going to be like. <laughs> how, many, uh, how many married guys do we have in this audience? Married folks, uh, may I see your hand please? Okay, you guys are not married. Got one right back here, not married. Brother Harold, you've been married, right? He can't hear me. He's been married. Okay. Uh, what about it, married folks? How's your relationship? Pretty good. There's a liar in every crowd. <laughs> do, do we have any perfect marriages among us? Say it again. That, that's the way you feel? Yes. I hope <laughs> <Well>. she does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said that some time ago to an audience of about 1,500. I said, how many of you have a perfect marriage? And there was a guy. If you have a perfect marriage, would you stand up? And there was a guy in the audience that stood. His wife did not stand, but he stood. <laughs> I'm not sure about your wife. Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, folks. I don't have a perfect marriage. I've been married for 46 years today, and uh, my wife, she's close, but she's not a perfect wife, and I'm certainly not a perfect husband. And in 46 years of marriage, my wife and I have had our share of fusses and fights. You have a fuss and fight at home? Do you head like this? Sure you do. I mean, if you walked up to me and you said, now, Brother Keith, I've been married for 25 years, and in 25 years of marriage, my Wife and I have never had a single fight. I'm going to look at you and I'm going to say, Brother, I love you, but you need to repent. <laughs> Liars won't make it. Liars won't make it. <laughs> Back in 1974, 1975, when I first uh, started preaching at the time, if I preached on marriage, I would get up and I would say something like, you know, one out of every four marriages ends in divorce. 25% of all marriages die. That was 1974, 1975. Well, I went on to college, graduated in 1979, moved to Missouri, started preaching for a little church in Missouri. And at the time, if I preached on the family and relationships and marriage and the home, I would get up and I would say something like, you know, one out of every three marriages ends in divorce. 33% of all marriages die. That was 1981, 82, 83. And here it is, 40 years later. 
And those who study this tell us that out of every 100 marriages, about 50 of them die. About 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Let me tell you what that means in a very practical sense. If you have two children, two kiddos, in all likelihood, one of them will end up getting a divorce. If you have four children, in all likelihood, two of them will end up getting a divorce. And yet God says, I hate it. He did say that, didn't he, brothers? Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God says, I hate putting away. I hate divorce. And God says, because I love you, I want you to know that I, I, I don't want you to get a divorce. And maybe God doesn't want us to get a divorce because He Himself has been divorced. Do you realize we worship a divorced God? See, if you've gone through the awful agony of divorce, I don't have to get up here and scream at you. Uh, you know how badly it hurts. You know how painful it is. And God Himself has been divorced. Jeremiah 3 verse 8, God said, I, I gave Israel a writing of divorcement. God knows the pain of that. God was rejected by His Old Testament people, and God says, I gave them a writing of divorcement. And because God loves us, He says, hey, I want you to have happy homes. I want you to have marvelous marriages. I want you to have fantastic families. You say, Keith, I have a good marriage, but my marriage could be better. How could it be better? I have a good relationship with my children, but my relationship with my kids could be better. How could that be better? Well, what I want to do, I want to give you some bricks that will build a happy home, a marvelous marriage, and a fantastic family. I'm glad that you're here. Let's listen to our Father. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. If you have a Bible, go with me please. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. So it's right after Galatians, right before Philippians, Ephesians chapter 5. Usually when we go to Ephesians chapter 5 to talk about relationships in the home, marriage in the home, we start at what verse, guys? Yeah, we start at verse 22. About the wives submit. Have you read verse 21 lately? Ephesians 5 verse 21. Paul said, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Sometimes I'm the coach... And my wife is the quarterback. Sometimes she's the coach. And I'm the quarterback. Uh, see, marriage is a give and take relationship. You give a little bit, you take a little bit. You surrender here, you surrender there. You submit to one another. That's what Paul said, verse 21. And then he says, now ladies, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. Here's the reason. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church submits to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. We men are thinking, boy, this is good stuff. Straighten these women out. And I can almost hear somebody saying to the Apostle Paul, preach it to him, Paul. Preach it to him, Paul. Sing that invitation song. Let these women respond. And Paul says, now wait a minute, guys, I've got a message for you too. Listen up, verse 25. Men, husbands, guys, brothers, husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the Word, that He might present to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such blemish, it should be holy and without blemish. Be pure. Be pure. And then he says, So ought men, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body of his church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a, oh, it's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence or respect her husband. Children, boys and girls, young people, teenagers... Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1. 
Obey your parents in the Lord. This is, this is a good thing. It's a right thing. Honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth, 98 years old. Would you like to be 98 like Brother Harold? Honor your father and your mother that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth and your fathers, daddies, granddaddies. Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through chapter 6 and verse 4. About 30 years ago, Sandra and I built a house in Hendersonville, where I currently live. We've lived there for 30 years. And it took a lot of bricks to build that house. You know what's true with building a house is also true with building a home or building relationships. It takes a lot of bricks to build a healthy home and a fantastic family and, and a marvelous marriage. So what I want to do for a few minutes in this session, as they've asked me to do, I want to talk to you about some bricks that will build a happy home, a marvelous marriage, a fantastic family, a healthy, righteous relationship. Here's number one. Brick number one is the brick of concern. Concern. Paul was concerned enough about the home that he wrote on it, right? He's really writing about Christ and the church. But he emphasizes Christ and the church by using marriage and the family. It's a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? Christ and the church. That's his emphasis. But to do that, he uses the illustration of the husband and wife relationship. The Holy Spirit was concerned enough to say some things about our relationship in our marriage. We're concerned about a number of things. We're concerned about uh, the cars that we drive. So we wash them. We vacuum them. Uh, we're concerned about our houses. We clean them. We paint them. We're concerned about, Tyler, our, our bodies. So we jog and we exercise and great lesson. I told Tyler he's a great preacher. We're concerned about our bodies, so we jog and we exercise and we go on diets. Is there anybody, guys, is there anybody in this room who's on a diet? You kidding me? Nobody? Just ask us how many of us were married. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not on a diet, huh? Hey, how many of us need to be on a diet? Yeah, brother, get those hands up. I heard about a guy that was on a diet, a very huge guy. Every morning he would get up and he would weigh. He would step on the scales to weigh. And as he weighed, he would hold his pet cat, his tomcat, in his hands. It was a big old cat. And if you look down and notice that he had gained a pound, he would starve the cat. That's my kind of diet. I like that diet, okay? <laughs> but we go on diet. Why do we go on diets? Because we, we're concerned about our bodies. And what's true with our bodies and our houses and our cars... Is true with our homes and our families and our marriages, our relationships. We've got to be concerned, truly concerned. I tell people all across America, if you can only save one thing, save your soul. Save your soul. I assume that all of you are saved. You know, I don't know that. I'm not your judge. But I think about what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 26. What is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So I beg people all across America, please be saved. I mean, I mean, if you need to be baptized, please be baptized. If you need to come back to Jesus, come back to Jesus. And I plead with that. But if you can save your soul and something else, save your marriage, save your family, save your home. I, I mean, think about what's more important than your relationship with your wife? Are your children? Is it the job? Is it the nine to five making money? What's, what's more important than your home? But to save that home, you've got to be concerned. Concerned enough to pray. Uh, concerned enough to read good books. Concerned enough to listen to good lessons. Uh, concerned enough to go to counseling. Number one, the brick of concern. Ready for number two? Number two, the brick of charity. Now when I say charity, I'm not talking, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'm not talking about a handout, a giveaway. 
uh, now by faith, hope, charity, these three, and the greatest of these is what? Charity, love, that's what I'm talking about. Go back to verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, men, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Question. Did Christ love the church, guys? Bled for the church, didn't he? Died for the church. And I've heard people say something like, ah, church is not that important. You ever heard that? You know, what's really important is your relationship with Jesus, becoming a Christian, knowing Jesus. Now, you know, you can go to the church of your choice because the church is not that important. Church really doesn't matter. Oh, does the blood of Jesus matter? Does the death of Christ matter? You say, Jesus' blood, Jesus' death. <laughs> There's nothing more important than the death of Christ. And you're right. But if the death of Jesus is important, then that for which Jesus died is important. Don't minimize the church. Don't criticize the church. Paul said that Jesus bled for the church. He died for the church. Acts 20, verse 28, he gave his blood for the church. And Paul said, now Keith, you loved your wife just like Jesus loved the church. Excuse me? Die for her? That's what he said. Go down to verse 28. Look down to verse 28. Sought men to love their wives as they loved their own bodies. Everybody look up here. Look up here. Do you see this body? This six foot three, 200 and <clears throat> pound body. I love this body. I, I feed this body. I clothe this body. I take care of this body. And Paul said, now Keith, you love Sandra just like you love yourself, your body. He goes on to say, Ephesians 6 verse 1, children, boys and girls, teenagers, obey your parents and the Lord. This is right. And on and on, Paul goes in Ephesians 5 and in chapter 6 and talking about relationships in the home. He's talking about this thing called love. Question, what is love? We talk about it. We sing about it. Love, 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 love. But what is love? Some of these teenagers could say, oh, man, I could, I could write a book on love. I know what love is. Love is when I walk her to the door and kiss her goodnight. That's love. H have I told you how I met my wife? My first wife? My only wife? I, I met her on a blind date. March the 1st, 1974. Kyle, do you remember the first date of you and your wife? Can you give me the day? I've just given you the day. March the 1st, 1974. I was 17. She was 15. A friend of ours got us together, a friend by the name of Ronnie. She went to church with Ronnie. I went to school with Ronnie. Ronnie knew us both. He got us together. We went out on a blind date. We had a good time. I walked her to the door, and I wanted to kiss her goodnight. So I just came out, and I asked her, I said, uh, Sandra, may I kiss you goodnight? And she just stood there. She looked at me. <clears throat> and so I cleared my throat. I stood up a little bit straight. And I said the second time a little bit louder, Sandra, may I kiss you goodnight? Still no answer. So I did it again. The third time I said <clears throat> a little bit louder, Sandra, may I kiss you goodnight? Still no answer. I said, girl, are you deaf? She said, no, boy, are you paralyzed? And so I walked over there and I planted one on her and gave her a big old kiss. She pushed me back and she said, where'd you learn how to kiss like that? I said, siphling gas from my daddy's tractor. <laughs> you, you, believe that, you don't believe that story, do you? O only part of that story is true. We did meet on a blind date. I was 17, she was 15. A friend of ours did get us together. We went out, had a nice time. And believe it or not, I, I did kiss her on the first date. Young guys, you watch kiss. Don't you ever kiss on the first date. It might lead to three kids, six grandbabies, 46 years of marriage. Don't you ever kiss on the first date. But that's what I did. And somebody says, oh, that's love. Love is when he walks. Makes me feel good. And I've heard people say something like, you know, love is a feeling. Love is a feeling that you feel like you're feeling when you feel a feeling that you never felt before. And I say, excuse me, Keith, I'm in love. Oh, you're in love? How do you know? Man, I feel it right here. 
And, and I wouldn't trade what I feel right here for anything in the world. Love is a wonderful feeling. Love is a feeling that you feel like you're feeling when you feel a feeling that you never felt before. And I say, have you ever backed up to an electric fence? If you back up to an electric fence, you're going to feel a feeling that you never felt before. But that's not love, is it? Not according to the good book, 1 Corinthians 13. Paul said that love is patient, and love is kind, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not rude, it is not proud, it is not self-seeking. And on and on Paul goes saying that love is doing, and love is serving, and love is giving, and love is saying, honey, Sandra, you, you first, me second. And I'm saying to you folks, if you want a happy home, if you want a marvelous marriage, a righteous relationship. You've got to be concerned about it, thinking about it, praying about it, asking questions, going to counseling. But number two, you've got to have that brick called charity or love. You ready for number three? Now, Tyler, you're a great preacher, but not all of your points started with the same letter. Two of them did. The E's. I got the E's down, okay? I can't remember the other three, but the E's, right? But number three, compliments. Compliments. And by compliments, I simply mean you need to spend more time bragging on one another and less time criticizing one another. You're in Ephesians chapter 5, flip back to chapter 4. Chapter 4. Look to verse 29. Ephesians 4 verse 29. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. What does that mean? Don't cuss. Don't use God's name in vain. Don't tell dirty jokes, muddy stories. Don't speak evil of people. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. But, first of all, He tells us what not to do. Don't do this, but let me tell you what you ought to do. But, that which is good, speak good words for what purpose? What's the, what's the text say, verse 29? For what purpose do we speak good words? To edify, to build up. Let, let me just say it like this. Uh, you need to spend a lot more time bragging on your wives and very little time criticizing your wife. Do, do you realize it takes about seven compliments to offset one negative criticism? It takes about seven positives to offset one negative. It really does. Uh, illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's say that four or five of you walk out and say, hey, thanks for the lesson. Appreciate that. That makes sense to me. You know, that's going to be a blessing in my life. And, and then somebody marches out and says, ha, waste of time. That was the sorriest class I've ever been, been to. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go away thinking about that sorry Bible class that I've just taught. See, it takes about seven positives to offset one negative Criticism. You say, Keith, this is a Bible class. Give me some Bible. I'm just giving you some Bible. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but what is good to build each other up. Say to that wife, ah, oh, you've never looked better in your life. Say to those kids, we love you. We're proud of you. Say to mom and dad, mom and dad, thank you. Thank you, mom and dad. Spend more time bragging and less time criticized. You know what's amazing to me? We do a better job bragging on strangers than we do bragging on home people. Uh, we do a better job bragging on people we do not know than bragging on people that we live with. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. You go out to eat, nice restaurant. What's a nice restaurant in town? Bob Evans? Say it again. Say it again, Craig. Trace Ermont. Trace Ermont. I think it's the only one in town. It's the only one in town? <laughs> nice restaurant. It's the only one you go out to... It sounds kind of like French to me. Go out to Trace... Trace well, you go, you, go to, you go to Bob Evans, okay? <laughs> you go out to Bob Evans, and, and you sit down, and here comes this waitress. You know, you've, you've never seen her in your life. She's a stranger, but she comes bouncing out there. And maybe she has long, flowing, beautiful black hair under each arm. I mean, she's a sight, you know. She comes bouncing out there. May I take your order and you order? And then she brings you the dinner. Thank you. At least you say thank you, right? Thank you, ma'am. How is it? Oh, this is, boy, this is good. 
compliments to the chef. And, and then before you leave, what do you do? You reach into your pocket and you pull out that dollar compliment at Bob Evans, okay? A dollar compliment. At your place, a $10 compliment. Huh? I mean, you tempt the waitress, right? And then we go home and maybe your wife fixes that favorite meal. Maybe it's roast beef, carrots, and potatoes. And you just sit there and you eat. And, and she's wondering, how is it? And, and what do we say, fellas? What do we say? Pass the salt. Or maybe, have you ever asked this? You know, maybe she's worked for two or three hours on the meal and you, you, you taste of it. And the very first question is, honey... Where, where did you get the meat? And she's sitting there and she's thinking, man, he doesn't like it. So, so she says, well, honey, what's wrong with the meat? Well, I'm not saying something's wrong with it. I'm just asking, where did you get the meat? Well, if you don't like it, you don't have to eat it. And on and on we go, fussing and fighting and grappling and grappling. And I'm saying, your home can be better. How can it be better? Concern, charity, compliments. You ready for number four? Brick number four is this one, courtship. Courtship. And by courtship, I simply mean whatever brought you together, we'll keep it together. Steve, what brought you together? How long have you been married, Steve? 46 years January. 46? Hey, you and I have got something in common. I'm a little bit uh, deeper into that uh, well than you are, but just a few months. 46 years. When's your anniversary? January the 6th. January the 6th. Okay, just a few months away. You can survive. I've survived 46 years. 46. That's great. What brought you together, Steve? My cousin introduced me to his girlfriend. <laughs> Your cousin introduced me to, to his... To, and you, you stole the girlfriend? <laughs> I wish I hadn't asked. Okay. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, okay. How did you steal the girlfriend? Met her at a basketball game, okay? But, but you had a few dates, right? I mean, you, you had a few dates. and Maybe you sent a, a, a card or two, maybe a phone call. You know, back, uh, we didn't have these cell phones back in our day, but we, we had these line phones. Maybe you called her once in a while. Maybe you probably have given her some flowers once in a while, right? No? <laughs> Steve, remind me never to talk to you in a Bible class. <laughs> okay. Whatever brought you together, we'll keep it together. What brought you together? Well, whatever brought you together, we'll keep it together. So let me just plant this seed. Before, let's just say a week. Here it is Friday before now. And next Friday, July the 1st to July the 8th. Do something nice for your wife, fellas. Uh, you, you don't have to do it and tell her that I told you to do it. Just, just do it, okay? Do, do something nice for your wife. Hey, take her out to eat. To, what's the place? Yeah, take her there. Is it Mexican? She'll have bad breath. Don't take her there, okay? <laughs> now, take her out to eat to her favorite restaurant. Uh, buy her some flowers once. You know, 40, 46 years of marriage, we've kind of gotten away from that flower stuff. But once in a while, send her some flowers. Write her a card. You guys can write, you can still write, write her a card. Do something nice. Hey, take her on a little trip. Wouldn't that be nice? I've got an idea. Bring her to our state, the state of Tennessee. You've got some beautiful hills around here, but somebody mentioned Gatlinburg a few minutes ago. Bring her to Gatlinburg. Give her some money. Let her shop. Let her shop until she drops. Let her buy some of those good old Smoky Mountain souvenirs. Made in Hong Kong, okay? <laughs> Do something nice for your maid, and I promise it'll be a blessing to your life. You ready for number five? We're going to go back to Ephesians. Communication. Communication. How we talk. It's hard to have a healthy relationship when there's no communication. Again, notice what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Paul knows the value, the importance of communication in our homes, in our families, in our relationships. Let me give you three, four, five principles about 
Better communication in the home. Number one, always tell the truth. Always tell the truth. Look back to verse 25 of Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 verse 25, what did the apostle say? Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. One of the top needs of a woman is the need to trust. Don't ever lie to your wife. Always tell the truth. I remember Proverbs 6, six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination. Do you realize that two of them have to do with dishonesty? Out of all the things that God hates, God says, I hate a lying tongue. I hate a false witness. Don't, don't ever lie. Always tell the truth. That's principle number one. So be, be open, be honest, tell the truth. You ready for number two? Listen and listen carefully. Check out verse 29. Zach, check out verse 29 in your Bible and tell me what's the last word in your Bible, verse 29, Ephesians 4. Hear, Hear us. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but what is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister a blessing, grace unto those who listen. Principle number two, listen and listen carefully. Guys, God gave us this many ears. God gave us this many tongues. Why two ears and one tongue? Maybe He wants us to listen twice as much as we talk. So just listen and listen carefully. Carefully. The wise man put it like this, Proverbs 18 and verse, I think it's verse 13. He that answers a matter before he hears it, it is a folly and a shame. So number one, always tell the truth. Number two, listen and listen carefully. You ready for number three? Two negatives, two don'ts. Don't slander and don't yell. Don't slander, don't yell. Go down to verse 31, Ephesians 4. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. In my mother's Bible, the old King James says, clamor. What in the world is that? Clamor. What does your Bible say, Zach? Clamor? You got my mother's Bible? New King James. Okay. Any other translations? Ephesians 4 verse 31. Say it again. Well, let all bitterness, and I'm not sure, you know, the order in your Bible, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. What's the next one on the list? Evil speaking, okay. That's the gossip, that's the slander. Obviously, don't do that. But hey, if you fuss and fight, just don't let your neighbors hear you, okay? Tone it down. It literally means shouting. Don't shout, don't scream. So two negatives, don't slander, don't put people down, don't belittle people, don't belittle your kinfolks, especially those that you live with, and don't shout and scream and fuss and fight where everybody hears, tone it down, watch your tones, watch your body language. You ready for number four? Talk to home folks like you want to be talked to. What does that sound like? Talk to, talk to your wife like you want to be talked to. Guys, what does that sound like? Yeah, that sounds to me like the go-to rule, Matthew 5, Matthew 7, verse 12. What if you would that men should do to you? Do you even so to them? Notice how Paul puts it in verse 32. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Just be nice. Be nice to your wife. When you talk, be kind. Just talk to her. Do you like to be screamed at? you like to be yelled at? Most of us don't. So talk to your sweetheart like you want your sweetheart to talk to you. Some principles for better communication in the home. What are they? Always tell the truth. That was number one. What was number two? Listen, listen carefully. Verse 29. What was number three? Two, two negatives. Don't slander and don't yell. And then number four, talk to home folks. Be, be kind. Talk to home folks like you want home folks to talk to you. And then as we bring this thing to a landing, concern, charity, compliments, courtship, communication. If you want a happy home, a marvelous marriage, a fantastic family, we can't leave. The last brick is the very best brick, and the last brick is this one. It's Christ. Eight times in Ephesians chapter 5, you find this word, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. 
Eight times Christ is emphasized. I want you to meet somebody. I want you to meet somebody. Jesus, would you come and tell us who you are? I am the living bread. John 6, 51. I am the light of the world. John 8 and verse 12. I am from above. John 8, 23. Before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. John chapter 10. I am the resurrection of the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, and verse 6. I am the true vine. John 15, and verse 1. Maybe you're on edge at home. Maybe it hasn't gone so well recently. You're struggling maybe in your relationship with whoever. And you need help. You need answers. And Jesus steps out from this book. And, and Jesus says, hey, I am. I'm the answer. So I, I guess I'd like to ask this closing question. Does Jesus live in your home? Do you live in a home where the Bible is read, prayers are prayed? Uh, Jesus is talked about just in everyday, normal, average conversation. You talk about Jesus at home. You talk about His people, His church. But especially, do you talk about the head of the church? Do, do you pray prayers with each other and for each other? Do you pray for your wife? Do you read the Bible with your wife? Do you have home devotionals? Does Jesus live in your home? I heard about a woman that was working around the home and all of a sudden... A knock came to the door. She went to the door and she saw a man standing there with a Bible in his hand. And the man asked one question. Ma'am, we're just doing a little survey. Does Jesus live here? The woman that I'm talking about was a Christian, a member of the church. But she was so uh, surprised and taken by that unexpected guest. She didn't know how to, how to respond. And all day long, she thought about that question. Does Jesus live in our home? Her husband came in that afternoon. She shared the story with him. She said, you'll never believe what happened today. I, I was working around the house and all of a sudden there was a knock at the door and went to the door and there was a stranger with a Bible in his hand. He asked me one question. He said, ma'am, does Jesus live here? And she said to her husband, I didn't know what to tell him. And he said, you didn't know what to tell him. You should have told him yes. We go to church every Sunday. Most Sundays we put a little money in the basket, the plate. We, we even have names and pictures in the church directory. And she said, oh, that's true. We do have names and pictures in our directory. We go to church every Sunday. Most Sundays we give a little money. But she said, uh, honey, the guy at the door did not ask that question. He asked, does Jesus live here? And I've been wondering all day if he does. I came to bless you. And I'm telling you, if Jesus lives in your home, it's a blessing. Some bricks that will build a better relationship, a marvelous marriage, fantastic family, a happy home. Got to be concerned about it, thinking about it. Got to have that most important, now by faith, hope, love, these three. And the greatest of these is charity. Spend more time bragging, less time criticizing. Courtship, whatever brought you together, we'll keep it together. Communicate, always tell the truth, the other three principles. And then the last one, Christ. Let Jesus live in your home. Well, I think they told, what time was I to quit? Griffin, what time was I to quit? 1040? Well, I'm 1042. With, with Brother Dindy? Huh? All right. Well, let, let's pray. Father, I'm thankful for 46 years of marriage with uh, the best person that I know. I am grateful for this class. It's easier to preach than to practice. I want to be a better husband, a better father, a better grandfather. Help me, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.